All right, hello everybody. Welcome to our last lecture topic of Chem 220, which is electrochemistry. We have seen electrochemistry in our cell potential lab, and in that lab, we were building simple constructs of batteries, which are things that you and I use every day to power most everything we own. So we're gonna dive deep today into why it is that we can generate some kind of cell potential or voltage from an electrochemical cell or battery, um, what kind of arrangement we need to organize our redox reactions in to achieve some kind of potential, and then also how we can determine the spontaneity of an electrochemical cell and also make relationships to that cell existing in a state of equilibrium. So let's go ahead and get started. So first up, let's define a voltaic or galvanic cell. These are types of electrochemical cells. They have fancy names, so I'm gonna call them voltaic cells. These are chemical batteries, which I'm going to use the word cell here to be very general because there's a bunch of different types of constructs of batteries. that utilize a spontaneous redox reaction to establish a voltage, which then leads to a current or flow of electrons. So the main qualifier for being a voltaic cells is that these are cells that are spontaneous. So these again are the result of redox reactions. So let's talk about redox again. If we have something that is oxidizing, so the oxidized substance, AKA the reducing agent, And then we have the reduced substance, AKA the oxidizing agent. Then a voltaic cell is one where we will expect to see electrons transferred from the oxidation and then flow through, reduce a substance, and then be transferred back so we have a complete circuitry. Now, it's really not electrons here, but other ions that are charge carriers. Spectator ions that allow for this circuitry to be complete. But in a nutshell, because we have the spontaneous generation of electrons from the oxidation, causing then a spontaneous reduction um, on the other side of our electrochemical cell, then we are by definition a voltaic or galvanic cell. So it is this flow of electrons that creates a current And by looking at the magnitude of the current or even just considering the difference in the chemical potential of one side versus the other of this kind of twin parts of our redox reaction, we can then determine the voltage that this particular cell could establish. So we have seen these electrochemical cells, specifically voltaic cells um, in our lab. So it, just like we saw in our pri uh, prior slide, the way that we make an electrochemical cell is by specifically separating our oxidation and reduction half reactions. So in these half reactions, we typically, if we're looking at a metallic based cell, we have a metal solid, in a solution of metal ion. 
and by splitting up the oxidation and reduction half reactions, we can then generate that electron flow through some kind of conduit, and we can also kind of put in the middle of our circuit a voltmeter, which allows us to measure the cell potential or the voltage. So let's kind of look over here at what's going on at the oxidation half reaction. So the oxidation half reaction in electrochemistry is called the anode. So this is the site of oxidation. And let's think about what it means for oxidation to occur. Remember, oxidation is loss of electrons. So we have here our solid metal, our zinc. And if we were to zoom in on what's going on with our zinc, we would see that electrons, these guys here, are leaving through the bulk solid metallic zinc. And as a result, that is kicking out zinc ions into solution. So we have electrons transferred through this piece of zinc metal and zinc ions placed in solution. So zinc kicks out two electrons, leaving behind in the solution zinc ion. Those electrons, once they travel through the solid zinc, which we call the anode, which is a specific name for an electrode or piece of metal <laughs> at which oxidation happens, then our electrons move through some wire, move through some other circuitry components, and then they enter the cathode. So let's consider what's going on here at the cathode. So when we consider the cathode, we are looking at the reduction half reaction. So the cathode is the solid site of reduction. So in this case, once our electrons have been transferred from the zinc through the wire and into the elemental copper, what happens is those incoming electrons are going to then go into solution and counter pre-existing copper ions. So we could think about like this. So electrons and copper ions at the metal surface then become solid metallic copper. So this is all innately happening like at the surface layer of our electrode. So here we have in our reduction copper ion near the surface of the copper solid taking in two electrons being reduced to copper metal. So if we were to write the overall redox reaction, right, we would show both simultaneous halves of this redox reaction happening at the same time. But because of our specific separation of the oxidation and reduction half reactions with their elemental and aqueous counterparts, we have now generated a charge pump that allows us to move electrons across a wire and thus generate current. Now the function of this guy here, the salt bridge, this is our charge stabilizer. Or charge equalizer. So you can imagine if we're continuously pushing electrons into the cathode and also then losing electrons from the anode, we're going to have an electrostatic buildup of positive charge in solution, positive, 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 and then negative charge in the bulk electrode on the reduction side. And that is not going to be good for us, right? Because at some point we are going to not be able to have like this nice, beautiful circuit where electrons are moving from the anode to the cathode, and then the circuitry is complete. So to make that circuitry complete, we utilize what's called a salt bridge. So the salt bridge is what allows the spectator ions. So here we've got like sodium and chloride ions 
to freely move between our beakers. So our half reactions contain like specifically the redox reagents. So that's the metal and a solution of the metal ion. But then also within these cells, we have things like our spectator ions, nitrate and sodium. So for example, um, sorry, not nitrate, that's from the compound, sodium and chloride. So for example, if we've got a buildup of positive charge here on the anode, then negative ions from some salt that's not involved in this reduction at all, or this redox at all, are going to move toward that site of positive charge buildup. And that's going to kind of like keep the overall ionic nature of what's happening in the beaker the same. Similarly, the electrons that are moved into the cathode are going to result in a natural flow of the positively charged sodium cation, so salt in our salt bridge, to move toward that buildup of excess negative charge. And in this way, we allow for there to be, again, this continued complete circuit where electrons flow from the anode to the cathode, and in doing so, that flow of electrons generates a current, which establishes a voltage. And we can make this current, or sorry, this circuit, effectively, that we've made, um, one that is kind of like able to regenerate and be more stable and avoid this buildup of electrostatic charge by introducing the salt bridge. So it's kind of like this. Now, what we see at the site of the anode is because solid zinc... becomes oxidized to zinc ion, we expect to see a loss in elemental or metallic zinc at the site of the anode because it is only through the creation of like zinc ion in our oxidation half reaction beaker that we can even generate electrons in the first place, right? Oxidation is loss. This is the source of the electrons which then means that the cathode of the copper is where solid copper is deposited on the surface from our copper ions reducing. So we expect to see a decrease in the overall amount of zinc anode, an increase in the overall amount of like elemental copper cathode, and once we deplete the anode, our battery is dead. <laughs> and then it's time for us to try to think about how we could maybe recycle or reharvest these materials to use and build another battery again. So again, if we are considering a voltaic cell, this is something that is a spontaneous redox. So this is going to establish a spontaneous voltage or a voltage that is set up that allows us to do electrochemical work. So we've seen this, this is the structure of our voltaic cells and like what is happening at each of our electrodes. But now we're just kind of zooming in on a molecular level instead of building them in lab. And what I want to show you next is a way to represent all of this chemistry that's happening in this very specific construct of an electrochemical cell using what we call cell notation. So let's talk cell notation. Cell notation is exactly what I've said here. It's a shorthand. So this is a method of representing the construction of a voltaic cell or any electrochemical cell without drawing our diagram that shows our like separated beakers. So the way this works is we are gonna use two vertical parallel lines this is going to indicate our salt bridge and our separation that's implied between our two 
half reactions in our cell construction. So that double line is talking about, hey, we are separating each half reaction and connecting them via a salt bridge. On the left-hand side of this double vertical bar is where we describe what's happening in the oxidation half reaction, AKA what's happening at the anode. And on the right-hand side is where we see the reduction half reaction beaker or what's being described at the cathode. So here's how this works. We almost always start with the elemental form of either the anode or the cathode. So assuming again, we're looking at like a metallic base battery by drawing, let's call it a solid and C solid for anode and cathode substance respectively. So I'm going to start by saying, okay, let's look at what's going on in my anode. On the very far left, I would say I've got my solid anode electrode. And then I'm going to use a single vertical bar to indicate a distinction between phases. So like everything to the left of my salt bridge is talking about what's going on in my oxidation half reaction beaker. So this vertical bar is just to show Yes, you're in the same beaker, but your substance exists in like a different phase. So on the left, we have the actual electrode, the solid metal. Whereas to the right, we would show something like a, let's call it plus X. I don't know what the charge of this general anode ion is. And this is aqueous. So this is going to be our... ion of our anode that results from the loss of electrons. So we always start with the anode on the left. So we're saying here I have a solid metal electrode like zinc placed into a solution of zinc ion. That is my oxidation or my anode beaker. That is connected via a salt bridge and also some connective wire to what's happening in my cathode. And how we represent the cell on the right-hand side of the salt bridge is the exact mirror image of what we saw in the anode. So we will have over here now the cathode substance with its aqueous ion charge, where again, this vertical green line is meant to represent a phase difference. And then we terminate this shorthand with solid cathodes. This is not carbon, this is cathode. And again, this is indicating that we have the cathode, solid metal electrode placed in a beaker of its own ion. And this is where the site of reduction happens. So don't get confused by this notation. It is truly just that, a notation that is meant for us to be able to like envision our dual beakers. So I can kind of overlay this, the dual beaker with the solid electrode that is then connected via salt bridge to the cathode beaker that contains this solid electrode. And then we make these things bridge by a wire this is what the cell notation is like representing. So chemists are cheap and lazy. We like to use a shorthand. Now, I think by now we understand what's going on with the construct of a voltaic or spontaneous electrochemical cell. And we aren't in a physics class, so I think it might be worthwhile to bring up this idea of cell potential.
So let's define cell potential. which I'm gonna write as E cell. So I use capital E, mine looks like an epsilon, but that's just how I write, kind of in cursive. So you'll see also like E cell, like this. So what is cell potential? This is the voltage that an electrochemical cell establishes. And again, we are not a physics class, so what on earth is a voltage? So a voltage is an electrochemical potential energy. So remember, potential energy is like the measure of stored energy or the amount of energy that could do work. And if the oxidation half reaction and the reduction half reactions set up different voltages in each of their own beakers, then the change in voltage during redox or as a result of redox is what we call our cell potential. Now I like to think about like what voltage and potential is generally by thinking about it as like the charge pump. This is what keeps our electrons flowing from the anode to the cathode. So an example I think of cell potential that makes some like sense to me is going back to our general understanding of potential energy. So if I've got some initial state and some final state, at this initial state I have a high potential energy At this final state, I have a low potential energy, meaning that the difference between them represents a change in potential energy. And notice that I did show my change going downward, so I was able to convert all of this stored potential energy up here into work to wind up at my final state. So you can think about like a ball, at the top of a hill. At the top of a hill, it has a high amount of potential energy. Once it starts rolling down that hill, it converts that potential or stored energy into kinetic energy. And then it winds up at the bottom of the hill where it has lower potential energy because it is now at a lower height. So it is not able to accelerate um, because of its like as much, okay. It's not able to generate as much kinetic energy because of its lower position relative to the surface of the earth, um, which changes some stuff about like the gravitational force acting on it, yada, yada. Again, not a physics class. So if we're going to think about this in terms of electrochem, then you can think about our charge pump as being like the anode voltage and the cathode voltage where the electron is the object or item that is then being pumped or flowing from the anode to the, elect um, the cathode. So here's our electron. So it flows from high to low potential and that is what allows our electrons to be pumped through our electrochemical cell. 
Now, by definition, if we are talking about a spontaneous cell, so a cell potential is spontaneous if the voltage it establishes is positive. So if I were to look at the voltage here and voltage here, I need to figure out how I could determine the change in voltage such that that change is positive. And we can do that by looking at the difference between our cathode and our anode. So our cell potential is equal to the potential at our cathode minus the potential at our anode because that's the only way that we can get this potential here, which is a decrease, to become positive. So if we do lower minus larger, that gives us a positive potential. And the way that we can calculate this in theory, instead of doing this in the lab like we did in our electrochem lab earlier in last week, I believe, is by looking at standard state conditions. So I'm going to rewrite this expression to say that the standard cell potential is equal to the standard potential at the cathode and the standard potential at the anode. Now, what are these potentials? Like, what are these voltages? So let's define our standard reduction potential in volts. So the standard reduction potential is the measure of the potential of a half reaction, specifically a reduction half reaction, for various metal ions. These are all like derived from experiment. So these come from like experimental data, which means that just like things like our standard enthalpy or standard entropy of a substance has been tabulated for reference. So if we're looking at our standard reduction potentials, we're always going to be looking at this table of data that I've shown here to the right. So this table shows the amount of voltage that's established when a particular substance, I mean, I've got some non-metallic stuff in here too, right? But when a particular substance, namely halogens and or metals reduce. So remember, metals are pretty poor at reducing, right? That's what makes metals a metal. They like to oxidize. They like to become cations. So it makes sense that substances like fluorine, which are nonmetals and also very, very like prone to losing electrons, this when it loses, um, or sorry, this when it gains electrons, pardon me, this, when it gains electrons to fulfill its valency, is going to be very favored energetically, meaning it's going to establish a very positive potential. So this thing is better at reducing. They are stronger oxidizing agents. Whereas going down the table, down here, these are really strong things that oxidize or the very strong reducing agents. Now you'll notice that at the hydrogen electrode, that's our standard reference electrode, our standard reference potential, um, we've set that to zero, which is allows for all of these values to be positive. So if we are positive here, we are good at reducing. And if we are negative on this table, this means we are poor at reducing 
which means that we are better at oxidizing. So again, we can always calculate the standard state voltaic cell potential or standard reduction potential of an entire electrochemical cell by looking at the values of its cathode and anode standard reductions from a table like this and seeing what we should get in theory when we construct a cell like we did in this slide here. So we have done this a bunch of times. Um, let's go ahead and do this now. So let's calculate the standard cell potential for a voltaic cell. So I am telling us here by definition that if we are a voltaic cell, we have to have a cell potential that is positive because we are spontaneous that uses silver, silver ion, and tin and tin two ion half cell reactions. Write the balance net redox equation and identify the cathode and anode. So let's start, I think, with maybe identifying the cathode and the anode, because we know that the cathode is the thing that reduces, and the anode is the thing that oxidizes. So let's consult our table. If we go back and look for silver, silver ion and tin two plus, let's see if we can't find them. So let's see here, do we have silver, silver ion? Yes, we do. And then tin, let's see here. I think this one only has tin four. So let's do tin four instead of tin two. Let's change the problem. And let's compare which one of these seems to be better at reducing. So this is going to help us identify the cathode. Silver is higher up on this reduction half reaction potential list. Um, so this is going to be better at reducing or better at gaining electrons. So this has to be the silver ion. So silver, silver ion is what reduces. So we're going to write the reduction potential, potential Ag plus, plus an electron reduces to Ag, and we know that this standard reduction potential, or the voltage that is established when this reduction occurs, is 0 0.80 volts. Okay, then that means that our tin has to be the oxidation. So I'm going to show the reduction half reaction because this is what's listed. On our reduction half reaction table or our standard reduction potentials. So we have um, tin four plus going to tin two plus. There we go. And this standard reduction potential, when this thing is in fact reduced, is 0 0.15 volts. So we've identified the cathode and anode. We want to determine the cell potential. So remember, our cell potential is always going to be determined by figuring out the difference in the standard reduction potential of the cathode minus the standard reduction potential in our anode. So we've identified that the cathode must be our silver. It is better at reducing, and cathode is the site of reduction. So that's 0 0.80 volts minus the standard cell potential of our anode, or the site of oxidation. The tin 4 ion is worse at reducing and thus better at oxidizing compared to the silver ion. So when tin 4 reduces down to tin 2, 
this becomes a 0 0.15 voltage. And the difference between this, 0 0.8 minus 0 0.15, is 0 0.65 volts. Let's ask ourselves, is this positive? Yes, it is. So we know that we are spontaneous. Okay, cool. We've done one and two things that this question has asked. And now we need to tackle this last bit of writing the balanced net redox equation. So here I've shown the reduction half reaction. If I want the oxidation half reaction, I need to flip it. So I'm going to write here oxidation half reaction. That's going to be tin 2 plus plus 4 electron. Oop, no, nope, tin 2 plus. So the product now becomes the reactant. Goes to tin 4 plus plus 4 electrons. And the reduction half reaction remains the same. Our silver ion plus an electron going down to elemental silver. If we're going to have a balanced net redox reaction, we need to ensure that the number of electrons transferred is the same. So in order to be able, this is not four electrons, this is two. Why did I put four? I can't count. There we go. Two and two. So back here. If the number of electrons transferred is going to be the same, meaning the number of electrons generated from oxidation is going to be used to reduce, then we need to double all of the quantities in our reduction half reaction. So this becomes two silver ions plus two electrons going to two elemental silvers, meaning our net reaction where we look at reactants and products in sum would be SN2 plus plus 2 AG plus plus 2 electrons going to 2 AG plus SN4 plus plus 2 electrons. Notice we have two electrons on both sides. So now our balanced net redox becomes SN2 plus, that is not a 2, there we go, SN2 plus, plus 2AG plus, going to 2AG solid, and SN4. This is the balanced net redox reaction that when set up like we would our construct of a voltaic cell, would generate a positive potential of 0 0.65 volts, which allows us to create a charge pump and generate a current. So we could use this to like make a battery, right? This is gonna give us a positive potential. This will spontaneously generate some kind of electrochemical potential. So in our next video, what we're going to be doing is we are going to be looking at the relationships between the standard cell potential and free energy, which includes relating our like free energy to equilibrium, because remember from thermodynamics, those things are related. And then after that discussion, we will talk about what happens if we are looking at um, building an electrochemical cell, but instead of being at standard conditions, we will be at non-standard conditions. So I will see you in our next lecture videos. Thanks a lot.